welcome. Today, Publishers Without Borders. Did you know that nowadays anyone anywhere can upload their musings directly to a number of very popular websites, put a headline over it, and watch it go viral? No strict gatekeepers or editors. Some call these wide open sites platishers. We'll explain the term and the controversial trend in a moment. Also on the program, payday loans. Our public intellectual this week says they serve a critical need for low income people and big banks should learn from them. Then oysters, not as a first course, but rather a last resort against sea level rise. All this, plus art from Bushwick and Bed-Stuy and beyond, a visual treat not to be missed here today. First though, platishers. These websites like BuzzFeed and Gawker are neither wide open publishing platforms nor carefully curated old media. They are both blurred together, hence the invented term platishers. Anyone can contribute a post and it will look as if they actually work at BuzzFeed or Gawker or Medium or Thought Catalog where we find a cautionary tale. Thought Catalog came under fire for a piece headlined Ferguson, Missouri looks like a rap video. The whole site was attacked as white racist, fair criticism, or a misunderstanding of platishers. Joining us via Skype from Washington, D.C., Tim Herrera, reporter for the Washington Post, who wrote the article Inside the Contradictory World of Thought Catalog. Also on Skype from Los Angeles, Gabby Dunn, a comedian and journalist who writes sketches for Nickelodeon and BuzzFeed Video. Welcome to both of you. Hello from New York. Tim, define the term. What's a platisher? Um, so a platisher, you know, like you described, is just kind of the blurring between what we traditionally think of as a publisher and what we sort of think of as a, a very open platform. Um, it kind of combines the two, where you have, you know, on one side a, a stringent, you know, editorial operation with editors and writers and people on staff, and then, you know, just an open platform where really anybody with an internet connection can write a post, throw, like, throw a headline on it, and it can go, you know, live just anywhere for, for anybody to see. And for a journalistic background, in addition to what I said in the introduction, what exactly happened in that incident at Thought Catalog? So there were two incidents in particular over the summer where um, the Ferguson one that you mentioned was written by an outside contributor, not a paid staff person, nobody associated with Thought Catalog, just somebody who had written for him in the past and wrote this story about um, Ferguson. Um, you know, it was thrown up, uh, as Thought Catalog says, uh, without any type of screening or any oversight and released to the world. Um, you know, that's whether that's necessarily exactly how it happened. Um, you know, I, I spoke with some people for the story that don't totally agree with that. Um, but, you know, this is the trap that you know, these platishers can fall into, is people not on staff, um, you know, people who aren't being edited or aren't bouncing ideas off anyone, you're going to just write, you know, whatever they want, and it's up there out for the world. And then, you know, the editorial side of these operations, you know, can suffer for it. You know, Thought Catalog does have a paid staff, uh, some people who are you know, very talented, great writers, great reporters, but, you know, when stories like this go out, when they go super viral like this, the entire site suffers, including the editorial staff. Yeah, and if they go out under the URL, Thought Catalog, so their web address is on it. It looks like it's their branded material, and they've got some, at least, a moral responsibility for it in the eyes of people who are looking at the site. So, Gabby, tell us about your relationship with Thought Catalog. What have you done there? Uh, well, I was a contributor at first for a while, and then I became uh, an editor there, and I was working in their offices in New York. And, um, yeah, the, when I was working there, which was, uh, like, 2012, 2013, there, there was an editorial judgment to everything that went up. Um, no one could really post things on their own, as far as I knew. Uh, we had a submissions email, and you could cull through it and see what, what you wanted to post, what you didn't want to post, what felt like a thought catalog article, what didn't feel like a thought catalog article. Um, so the idea of a platisher, the idea that these things are just being put up by the writers is uh, sort of a new thing that I... When Tim interviewed me for his story, I felt was a cop out saying, oh, we didn't have any sort of editorial judgment. We didn't have any sort of hand in this. But every post that goes up on these sites has, you know, it needs to be put into the HTML. It needs to have pictures. It needs to like there. There's somebody looking at it. You can't just if anything could go up, then you would just have posts that are like a picture of a potato like that. That's not what's happening. Right. So there. So more than I described in the introduction, there is some selection process taking place, is what you're saying. 
in my experience when I was there, yeah, there was a selection. Uh, and, and, you know, there were articles that we would say, hey, do you guys think this is an article that works for Thought Catalog? And then they would say, uh, no, we don't really like this one. Or even people that are contributing now that I'm still in touch with, there are articles that they'll send that they'll say, this is a Thought Catalog article versus this isn't a Thought Catalog article. Like someone had to see, I don't know what's going on there now. I haven't worked there in a year, but I mean, it seems like someone has to approve what goes up. So what's your best guess or best information as to what happened with that Ferguson post uh, that looks so racist? A lot of times um, Thought Catalog's motto, all thinking is relevant, will backfire on it. So the site's uh, goal is to have different levels of thinking and to be open to everybody's opinion or thought process. But it, like I, there were some instances that Tim talks about in the article where I disagreed with our our publisher, our um, the head of the thought catalog at the time, because, when I was working there, because I didn't want to be associated with content that was going up that was supposedly fair game. As like, well, that's somebody's right. opinion, you know. Right. Uh, things that went up that were, for instance, I, I identify uh, as LGBT, and there was articles that went up that were clearly transphobic and. I was like, you know, I was getting emails from people who liked my writing saying, I'm disappointed in you. And I just didn't want to, I would say, hey, I don't really want that going up on a site that I'm so closely associated right. with. And they would say, okay, we hear what you're saying, but we're doing it anyway. Right. I mean, it's all clicks. It's all page views. Right. It's all about clicks. So, uh, Tim, why does this work if anybody can throw up content? Um, or if what Gabby is saying is right, and it's not really true that anyone can throw up content, and they're cura curating, you know, everybody's submissions and deciding which ones are going to be clickbait, uh, why does this work for the sites? How do they make money on this? Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, a designer for things like this, right? So, you know, if they publish a really, you know, like the two examples that we focused on in or that I focused on in my story, you know, two examples that a lot of people called hateful, that a lot of people just didn't get why anybody would publish it. You know, the fact is people are still clicking on those stories. Uh, you know, the, the transphobia one that I wrote about, you know, did almost a hundred thousand page views. Um, you know, people aren't necessarily clicking on that because they want to read the story, but because they're a little shocked, you know, that people would, that, that, uh, that an outlet would publish something like this. Yeah, um, the rage click, the rage view. Right, right. You know, hate reading, you know, is, is something that's very real and really, you know, a lot of publications trade yeah. on it. You know, Thought Catalog um, has sort of gained a reputation for uh, kind of, you know, running with that type of thing, publishing things that they know are incendiary, that they know people are going to very strongly disagree with. But you know, the fact is, people are still clicking on those stories. Um, and whenever you know, Gawker, whenever Gawker would run something with a like fourteen links to the worst thought catalog articles of the week or something, um, we would have like a rain of page views. Like we would just be like, "Sweet, thanks, Gawker." Right. So even if something is critical of you, just uh, please spell our website address correctly because yeah. it's going to drive a lot of traffic to our right. site. Right? right. That's why, Tim, you know, at the Washington Post, sometimes the journalistic judgment when there's something that's hateful out there that really isn't relevant to the, to the important discussions, we decide just not to draw attention to it because it does more harm than good, unless there's a real journalistic reason that we have to be discussing it. But Gabby, I'm curious if, when you were working at Thought Catalog, if there was significant debate about that slogan that you just cited, all opinions are relevant. That is to say, somebody could get up there and say, Hitler was good and the Holocaust was great, you know, and that that opinion is relevant. To take the most extreme example I could think of, sure. In my experience, uh, that was taken very seriously, the all thinking is relevant motto, um, to the point that some people call it trolling, right, where you just say something incendiary just to just to do it, just yeah. to be the, the devil's advocate or whatever. Uh, and there were, yeah, there were instances where I was very uncomfortable with things that were being posted and I would say, I, I don't think we should run this. I don't think we should do this. Um, and it would get posted anyway. And I think, yeah, the people that run the site, at least in my experience of them a long time ago, really do think there is maybe a disconnect there where they really do think that 
well, why, why can't we say every opinion? Why, why do we have to be politically correct? This sort of idea that like, oh, if you're not saying something feminist, if you're not saying something pro LGBT, whatever, you're going to get mobbed on the internet, right. which you but will, the, but, Tim, Tim, but you're also wrong. Right. And, and there's a, you know, there's a lot of space between the old New York Times slogan, all the news that's fit to print. So some old editors are sitting in a room you know, it would be the stereotype deciding what's fit for everybody else to read. There's so much room between that and what Gabby was just describing about really believing that all opinions are relevant. What about some of these other platishers, Tim? BuzzFeed, Gawker, is there sort of a continuum um, with Thought Catalog at the most extreme end? Yeah, so I mean, all these, you know, uh, publishers that also have an editorial component, um, you know, they're really kind of skirting this in-between zone, um, you know, where they're kind of trying to have it both ways, where they want to be this open platform that anybody can publish on and publish whatever they want. But on the other side, you know, they still do have an editorial operation with staff writers and reporters and editors. Um, so it's this, you know, weird in-between that everyone is really still trying to figure out. You know, BuzzFeed and, and Gawker are two of the higher profile examples of that. But, you know, Forbes has experimented with it. A lot of other publishers are seeing a real future in that. Um, and then, you know, on the other hand, you have places like Medium, where, you know, Medium is truly just an open platform. Um, they do have some paid contributors. Um, but, you know, it's, it's much more, you know, open than, say, Thought Catalog or, or Gawker. Um, but, you know, the, that's, that's really kind of where these places get into trouble, you know, getting back to the to Thought Catalog. Um, you know, they, when I spoke with Chris Laverne, the publisher, you know, he went on and on about how there's, you know, absolutely no editorial in, uh, oversight. There's no judging. Just anything that comes in goes up, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, he had told another outlet, uh, you know, very recently that he, in fact, hired employees specifically for their editorial judgment. Um, so, you know, this, this kind of weird in-between world where they're trying to have it both ways, you know, that's a, a, you know, a big trap that everyone's kind of falling into. And I think, you know, as, as this kind of idea of a platisher uh, expands over the next few years, you know, I think we're going to see, you know, places that are either going to have to really clamp down on moderation and really double down on just publishing the best things or, you know, completely open themselves up and just really have just take, take any type of editorial judgment completely out of the picture. Tim, um, uh, no, we'll, 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 oh, out. Gabby, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, it's a cop out. Like if you post anything people don't like, you can say, oh, that was, that article was a, a contributor that we didn't check. Right. But then if you post something that's really great, they can be like, that's a staff writer. Like you, you don't get to, there's no like chain of, you know, they're not releasing their email showing you what really happened. Right. So it's just like a way that they can get out of trouble every time. Well, we will see what the world brings us via platishers, and if platishers bring the wrath of uh, the community of internet users down on their own heads, who knows, if people may just not walk away from these sites. If they just are seeing a lot of hate, they may just decide it's not relevant and uh, move along. But uh, okay, folks, there's one of the things that's going on online these days. Gabby and Tim, thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for having you. me. for Public Intellectual, where we look at new research with the power to change minds and public policy. Our guest today may well change your mind about payday loans and storefront check cashing places. Lisa Servan, urban policy professor at the New School, once viewed these places as taking advantage of the poor until she studied them and took jobs as a teller in Mott Haven and in the Bronx, uh, that is in the Bronx, Mott Haven, and in Oakland, California. Professor Servan, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Why did you take jobs as a bank teller? Uh, not a bank te teller, actually, but a check casher teller um, and a payday loan teller. I, I took it because I was curious about why so many people were using these alternative financial services when all of the policy, all of the media leads you to believe that they're abusive and predatory and sleazy. And I knew from working in poor communities for 20 plus years that the people who live in those communities who tend not to have a whole lot of money um, know where every penny goes. First, let's establish a little bit how abusive they may be. What kinds of interest rates are they charging? Why do they have such a bad reputation uh, in, in the first place? 
I think the reason is, especially for payday loans, the APR, the annual percentage rate interest, is usually ranges from about 300 to 600 percent. Yikes. People hear those numbers and they raise their eyebrows. Um, the issue, though, is that when you look at the choices that people have, they're often no better. Um, one other way that people use, for example, to cover a short-term gap in their financing is overdraft, right? They just, you know, have a let a check bounce in order to cover an expense. Um, if you looked at the overdraft fees, which are now close to $35 every time you overdraft, it's about a 5,000% interest rate if we were to take that as a seven-day loan. That's from a regular bank. That's from a account. regular bank, yes. So as an academic study, did you have variables? What was your methodology? How was this academic research? So, uh, you know, I had looked at everything that was written. I actually started doing the research after I had a check casher from the South Bronx, my, my boss ultimately, um, come to one of my classes and talk about what that he felt like he was providing a useful service in low-income communities in the South Bronx and Harlem. And um, I had read everything else about them. I then went out and read as much as I could, looked at the FDIC reports on the unbanked and the underbanked. And I was left with the question still of if these businesses were so bad for people, why were they growing? Um, in, in the last 10 years, payday lending has grown from a $10 billion to a $30 billion industry. There are more payday loan outlets than there are Starbucks and McDonald's combined. So those things kind of made my, raise my eyebrows, and I knew it wasn't just that the people in those neighborhoods were stupid or ignorant. I knew there must be a reason. And so that's what led me to the field. Um, I worked for four months as a teller in the South Bronx and then three weeks full-time in Oakland, and then came out from behind that counter and did interviews with over 100 people who used those businesses. One common reason that's given that they're becoming so ubiquitous is that people are uneducated. They're ignorant and these are the only things that are there on their street corners in low-income neighborhoods. The mainstream banks aren't locating branches there like they seem to be every other right. storefront on the Upper West Side or, you know, in Soho. Um, and so they're there, they're available. People don't know what the difference would be if they went to a regular bank. Not true? Not, not necessarily true. Uh, accessibility is clearly part of the story, right? Availability in your neighborhood. Um, just to provide one statistic, there's one bank for every 3,000 households in Manhattan and one for every 20,000 in the South Bronx. However, there was a major bank branch three blocks from where I worked in Mott Haven and two bank branches on the same two block strip that I worked at in Oakland. So it's not just about availability. Um, when I talked to my customers and I asked them what they, the reasons why they were going to the check casher or the payday lender instead of the bank, they gave me three reasons, that some of which were counterintuitive. Cost, transparency, and trust. Um, so they found, for their situations, that the check cashers and the payday lenders were often less expensive. Mm -hmm. They found it like it was much more easy to tell what they could get at what price from a check casher. Tell me a story about these uh, a story about trust. Sure. Uh, maybe an individual. Yeah. And why they find more trust there, maybe like an old-fashioned bank right. from the 50s or a small town right. as compared to going to the local Chase or Citibank right. or what have you. Well, it's interesting that you raise that because I felt once I started working in these places much more like I did when I was a kid going to the bank with my dad in South River, New Jersey, the local Polish bank called Pulaski Savings and Loan than I do going to the major bank that I go to now. Um, so one day I'm working as a teller and a woman comes in who's probably in her mid-50s, a Puerto Rican woman who doesn't speak um, fluent English. So that's one thing right there is language. Um, she brings me a check that she wants to cash and I input her information into my computer terminal. I see her information flash up and there's a, there's a little message blinking to me that says that I'm supposed to get $20 from her every time she cashes a check. Now that would be different from the 1.95% of the face value that's the fee. And I was still new. I didn't know what to make of the message. So I asked the teller who had trained me and I said, what do I do here? And she said, oh, that's Marta. The last time she came in, the check bounced. So she's supposed to give us $20 every time she comes in to, to pay off the, the bad check. Now, first of all, that's unusual, right? The bank would have said bad check, they would have charged her for it, mm -hmm. maybe closed her, her checking mm -hmm. account. Um, so Marta comes and we're asking her for the $20 and she says, you know, I can't pay it this time, I've had an unexpected expense. 
So Christina, the teller who trained me, punches a few buttons. We cash her check minus the fee, and we know that she'll be good for it next time she comes in, right? So this practice of often kind of working around policy with a regular customer to accommodate their needs. Um, we saw it all the time. And uh, the, the ethos, and we got a lot of training in customer service, was to try to help people get what they needed every time that they come to the counter, as opposed to figuring out how to get them to do something for less money or to get them out the door quickly. Sometimes we translated letters for people that had come in English that they didn't understand. And in return, we got tips. People brought us coffee in the morning sometimes. Um, the woman who trained me was pregnant when I started working there, and people would drop off baby gifts for her after she left the office. So there was this very different feel to the branch than there is at most bank branches. I'm sure this happens at Bank of America, too. Uh, not since I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, spoiler. These are illegal in New York State. Payday Some loans are right? illegal. Payday yes. loans. Yes, they are, and in 12 or 15 other states. But people in New York are getting them anyway. They are. Yes, mostly online. And the online segment of that whole payday loan industry is the fastest growing piece of it. So if you were to Google at home, I'm not suggesting that anybody do this, but if you were to Google New York payday loan, you'd have screens full of people who are willing to give you a loan in about five minutes. And what about the check cashing? Why does that have a bad reputation like the payday loans? We understand that the payday loans have a very high interest rate. How about the check cashing? How do they get you on that? Well, I don't know that they get you, but I think that, um, I think that people feel like, for one thing, you shouldn't have to pay money to get your own money, right? So if I come in with a check, I should be able to get the whole thing. Although the problem is that people can't, you can't just walk into a check, even if it's uh, to a bank with a check, even if it's written by New York State or the federal government, and have it cashed, unless you have an account there. Unless you have an account there. Unless you have an account there. And that account, people feel, costs them money through monthly service fees. I actually just got a letter last week from my own bank that said that my monthly fee is going up from 20 to $25, 25% on January 1st. So that's a piece of it. The other thing is that um, these businesses typically don't offer a way to save. And saving, in terms of thinking about asset building, et cetera, is really important for people, right? We want to, one of the things that people say is that it's important to establish a practice of savings, even if it's a small amount per month. What I actually found when I talked to people was that they still didn't really trust the banks. A lot of people were saving informally, either at home, under the mattress, or in a coffee can. Some people even had multiple coffee cans, as the, you would, you know, a checking and a savings account and maybe a small business coffee can. Um, Do other they people, not know about FDIC insurance, that that money is protected up to $250,000? It's really interesting that people don't feel like the bank is trustworthy anyway. And actually, I got a, a note from someone who'd read one of my pieces who said he did what my parents did. He went to the bank with his daughter put in $50 with the idea that every month they'd go back and put in more money and she'd watch it grow. The next month they, may, they went back and the, the account balance was $45. She got $5 taken out because of uh, a balance that was too low, mm. right? So right there, you've discouraged someone from becoming a saver through a bank. Um, I also found a lot of people who save informally through these um, things called ROSCAs, Rotating Savings and Credit Associations. Lots of immigrant groups do it and they feel like it works better for them. So is there a new movement to re-legalize payday loans in New York State? Well, there is a, a proposal by the kind of Check Casher Association of America. They would love to make it legal. Uh, they have a proposal to the federal government or to the state government that would offer better rates than most of the payday lenders around the country. But it's, it's been turned down. Uh, it's been turned down for several years that they've been trying to get it through. What was it like for you as, um, I guess, as you describe yourself, a uh, white Polish girl, uh, <laughs> to go to work in Mott Haven every morning? I loved it, actually. I mean, I can't, uh, I, I don't know if it kind of connected with all my years of waitressing and doing other kinds of work, but it was a great change for me. Um, I did, I was out of place. Most of the people who live in, in Mott Haven are Latino immigrants, so coming in as a someone who's taller and blonder and older than most of the tellers, uh, it was interesting to stand behind the window, especially at first, and see a lot of people just pass by my window. Um, and I think, at first I thought it was because they would assume that I didn't speak Spanish, which was part of it. But ultimately, I think it was because I was new. And the two tellers I worked with, most of the time that I was there, had each been there 10 years, which is uncommon at most service kinds of businesses, right? They felt comfortable with the people who knew them and who could give them what they want, and sometimes anticipated their needs. Or did they think, 
when they saw you, uh-oh, now this neighborhood's gentrifying, it's over. Well, it's interesting because I, I would get off the subway at 138th and um, Alexander and I'd go to this Dunkin' Donuts if I got there early and I'd get a tea and a sandwich. And I, one day I was sitting there eating my sandwich and I heard this voice behind me say like, hmm, there's white people coming in here now. And I turned around and I realized I was the only white person, <laughs> so it, it must have been me. But I, I don't think I was a harbinger of huge change. Did the financial crisis affect this world or your view of it? Absolutely. Uh, I think the biggest change, and this is a really important point, is that there are many more Americans now who are experiencing uh, financial instability than there were before. So I went into the work really thinking that I wanted to understand the role of a check casher or a payday lender in a poor urban community. And what I found and continue to find as I continue the research is that it's not just those poor people in poor neighborhoods. Many, many more people are using these loans. And in fact, I'm working with some data right now that shows that the fastest growing group of payday loan borrowers are people who make $50,000 a year or more and are quite educated, which is quite different from what we saw 10 years ago. So I actually think that that's the big problem that policymakers need to, to attend to is not so much the suppliers of the loans, but the reasons why there's such a great demand. It's not just because there are more payday lenders, it's because there are more people who are in financial trouble. So after doing this study, do you uh, see yourself joining this movement to re-legalize payday loans in New York State, or do you take a position? I haven't taken a position yet, and that's partly because I think that we right now are really lumping all payday lenders together and all payday borrowers together. And what I'm trying to do right now with some of my work is to look at whether there's a group of borrowers who actually benefits from the loans, right? Maybe people who, we call them one and done. They have an emergency, they get a loan, they get out of trouble. It's not a bad thing. Then there are people who take many, many loans and they kind of get into this cycle where it's hard to get out. Maybe we need to look at them and separate them. By the same token, I think there are better and worse lenders. Some of them who really play by the rules. When I was working as a loan collector for part of the time, I had to read the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act before I could do that, right? So that was, in terms of obeying the law, that was a good lender. Other lenders sell their loans to third parties. They do make harassing phone calls. And so I think we need to look at the spectrum and figure out lenders that are actually serving the public well and maybe helping people. Um, and who knows, I don't know yet whether they can actually make a living if they were to kind of cut out the people who are in trouble with debt. But that's one of the things I'm looking at now. So do you think there are some states that are models out there where payday loans are still legal, but they're regulated in a better way than maybe they were here before? There are, I mean, that's the interesting thing about having these lenders being regulated at the state level is you basically have state-by-state -state experiments. And there are some places like Florida where there's a database um, where all borrowers are put into that database and you can see how many loans they have and you can't get more than one loan from, uh, from uh, uh, you can only borrow from one lender at a time. In other words, you can't get multiple loans. Um, in Washington state, they've changed, um, they've, they've created a cap. In Colorado, they've moved from a lump sum loan to an installment loan. So I think there are different models, and it's another piece of my research currently, is to look at what happened before and after, and if it seems as though the public is in a better situation given the changes. And you're doing more research, I gathering am. more data. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So I'm doing some work um, on subprime loans, and I'm also right now actually collecting stories on my own website, um, lisaservon.com. Um, there's a link that says money stories, and I really want to understand other people's experiences with check cashers and banks and credit unions and you want people to go to your website to share I their do. stories. I do, exactly. Well, one of the things I found walking around the world and kind of talking about my research or publishing things is that people tend to email me or pull me aside and talk to me. And I'm, I'm trying to get those stories and have kind of a, a national conversation all in the same place. LisaServon.com. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's fascinating. It's been a pleasure. And that's Public Intellectual for this week. I'm Brian Lehrer. Staten Island Oysters. Sounds like the name of a minor league baseball team. But the Oysters are the foundation of an innovative project that's about to get underway underwater. In Tottenville, designed by landscape architects at Scape Studio, the Living Breakwaters Project harnesses the ocean's natural defenses to combat the devastating effects of rising tides and destructive storms like Hurricane Sandy. Kate Orff, founder of SCAPE, joins us to discuss the benefits of this soft approach to flooding. 
Also with us, Pete Malinowski, Project Director of the Billion Oyster Project. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. And you're the designer and urban planner, and That's you're right. the sort of hands-on oyster biology guy? Yep. Tell us where this idea came from. And I will, so, <laughs> first of all, wait a minute, I want to tell the viewers that we had this conversation one time before, and it was like four years ago. It was before Hurricane Irene. It was before Sandy. Now everybody's interested in this kind of thing, but you were ahead of the curve. Where did the idea come from? Right. Well, I guess the idea generated um, um, actually in a competition that Pete and I worked on together back in the day called um, Oyster Texture. But it was a real, it was a concept that about a broader vision for integrating natural systems and rebuilding our sort of harbor-wide ecologies, but then also overlaying community-driven um, uh, involvement and, and engagement processes like the Billion Oysters Project and so on. So the idea is to bring together big picture resiliency concepts with onshore um, adaptive and resilient kind of social structures. And, and we have some images that we're going to show to let you see what this looks like or to get a better understanding visually. So let's put the first one up right now. And uh, sure. go ahead. Yeah, well, this is a great image because the project is titled Living Breakwaters. And it's really, uh, it's a system. It's not just a physical structure. The idea is that it's a resilient system that combines and pairs offshore living breakwaters with onshore dune systems and really begins to bring together the risk reduction capacity of those structures with onshore social resiliency in the form of schools and communities and Pete's um, Billion Oysters project and the breakwaters are designed in such a way that they're enhancing um, ecological life for fish, oysters, etc. So it's a regenerative system um, that builds resiliency over time. So Pete, tell us more about breakwaters. People may know what dunes are, they think of sand dunes, um, but breakwaters, maybe not so much. Well, I mean, breakwaters are a um, common form of shoreline protection that's been around, I and mean, Kate can speak to mm -hmm. since uh, Roman times. And um, the difference with these is that they have, um, they're seeded with oysters. So the, they're living breakwaters that are designed specifically to incorporate different um, ecosystems of fish and to serve the natural world in addition to the sort of on land protection. And congratulations on winning a Buckminster Fuller Prize. The great yep. legendary designer, Buckminster Fuller. And what does this prize right. get you? Oh, it was really exciting because um, we're, we're so happy to share that news. The project itself was funded, the Breakwaters Project was funded um, with a $60 million implementation grant by the state of New York. Um, so that part is moving forward, but there are going to be unfunded aspects of it. So the Fuller Prize is a great way for us to sort of advance a lot of the oystering work and a lot of the sort of work with the schools in Staten Island and other aspects, but they were really celebrating um, a holistic approach to the kind of interrelated crises of environmental and social um, issues. So it's a big win for us in that the systems approach was really um, uh, recognized. Let's put our next image up. And this is a map. <laughs> yes. Pete, you want to tell us where in New York City this is? Well, this is Tottenville. This is southern Staten Island. And so you have different um, individual spots identified here? Well, so the relevant the relevant sites for me are the schools that are identified. I'm pretty sure that's what the pink. The pink? The yeah. pink, are those, those are the, the walks that students would have to take to get to the water. Uh -huh. And what we do at the Billion Oyster Project is design curricula to engage public schools with the water through our oyster restoration work. So that's what you see with all those little pink dashes are the walks that school groups would take down to the waterfront to kind of break the land water barrier and see what's going on under the water and experience New York harbors, um, you know, the, the, the life under the water and what's going on there. So all those pink dots are the locations of actual schools. That's correct. Yeah, and the drawing also shows, I mean, the, this is the larger concept of three reaches, you would, be, you would call them, of, of breakwater structures that we'd be protecting, Tottenville, Crescent Beach, Annadale, and Lemon Creek. Um, the portion that was funded was this Tottenville reach. And I think it's really exciting because the drawing also shows this layered system that pulls together these sort of onshore schools and communities, kind of enhancing people's understanding and connection to the water. Um, the students will be helping to seed the oysters um, and, and, and steward them. Um, and uh, basically, we want to regenerate that kind of island culture and that mm -hmm. you know, knowledge of the water um, that once characterized our region. Did that part of Staten Island get socked by Sandy? Yes. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's actually loss of life, a lot of loss of uh, land through erosion. And I think that's a, just given how exposed it is in Raritan Bay, there's something that um, unfortunately, you know, could happen again and obviously more frequently in the future. And so why would this kind of soft approach 
prevent flooding better than a harder approach like dikes or seawalls? Right. Well, I think it's important to say that um, you know, New York City has something like 600 linear miles of shoreline. We're not going to build a giant wall along all those, <laughs> you know, that entire extent. So we've really advocated for a kind of a concept that is um, not completely stopping the flooding, but rather taking the harmful wave velocity out of the waves that really contribute to loss of life and property damage, right? A little a flooding in your basement is very different than a boat knocking your house off of its foundation. So the breakwaters reduce the wave velocity, step down risk, and in combination with the dunes, um, reduce flooding. So our project really begins to change the lines of the coastal A and the V zones in the area. Pete, you want to go further into that? Well, maybe I didn't ask the question well. I mean, maybe it's not either or or both and, a harder approach and a softer approach, or not really. Well, I think it's a combination for different, this is a very small piece of, of New York City's shoreline, right? So for different places in New York City, different treatments would make, would make sense. But just like Kate said, I, you know, I, I don't want to live in a New York City that's walled off from the water. You know, I think we've spent a century or two like facing inland away from the water and it's time now to turn back and to experience, you know, the, the city's largest park or whatever you want to call this giant harbor with all these natural resources that we haven't been taking advantage of for so long. Let's look at a breakwater right here. Pete, why don't you tell us what we're looking at? Well, so this is one of the breakwaters, uh, as you said, um, and it's built of, you know, typical breakwater construction um, materials is. like rocks and, and concrete, except in this case, the concrete is specifically designed to be more attractive to marine animals and not affect the pH of the surrounding water. And rather than just take the shoreline protection into consideration, the, the shape of the breakwater actually is, uh, provides habitat services for different size organisms depending on which part of the breakwater you're at. So I think it's really cool that, you know, there's a big plan to build something big in the water that's taking something besides just the human risk into consideration and actually providing ecosystem services. And am I seeing this right? Are they perpendicular to the shore rather than parallel? They're parallel to the shore, parallel and, and to just the shore. To, to, to build on what Pete was saying, that the other um, innovation and advancement in the breakwater design is that we design these things called reef streets, which are literally like public space for fish, in that they are pockets of micro complexity along the breakwater, um, and so they provide structural habitat. And when we met with fish and wildlife and um, so on, they said, this is really what we're missing in our harbor. We've dredged the harbor. We've gone from this thick 3D mosaic to kind of a flattened bottom. And the reef streets themselves introduce, reintroduce the structural habitat, places for juvenile fish to kind of dart in and feed and come back out, and also prevents, you know, provides this um, substrate for shellfish and oysters. So it's a, you know, it's a real kind of thick 3D mosaic that is protective and ecological. Public space for fish and juveniles. <laughs> so we're going to see fish, coffee carts, up, <laughs> right. fish, basketball yes, courts, <laughs> all that stuff. Right. What? Where do the oysters come in? I mean, the oysters, um, you know, Raritan Bay used to be totally full of oysters. It's, it's, for the most part, very shallow, and those reefs used to protect um, Staten Island. Um, the oyster reefs provide habitat for, all these, for hundreds of species of fish and invertebrates that um, live in New York Harbor. And so uh, we've been growing oysters on Governor's Island for the past six, six years. And um, so with the Harbor School is the primary school that we work with. Um, we've introduced over 11 million oysters into the harbor during that time. And the um, education program that we're launching right now, we actually just got a big National Science Foundation grant to, um, to develop a curriculum and institute a teacher training program at Pace University so that New York City public school teachers will be trained to implement Billion Oyster Project curriculum in their classes. And I think we have an image to show of mm -hmm. the education center. Oh, yeah. Right, the, the hub. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are hubs where... That doesn't look like a school. That looks like a beach. <laughs> well, at, at Harbor School, we've been taking students down to the water's edge for 12 years, and it's, it's a real challenge because there's no s facilities down at the water's edge. There's no bathrooms. There's no places. There's no, um, you know, protection from the elements. And so these provide for school groups and the general public a place where you can sort of interface with the water safely and with some conveniences and also have... Uh, obviously excellent views for bird watching. Is that the Harbor School on Governor's Island or is this also Staten Island? No, this is a, this is a um, design of a hub that would go along with the breakwaters on, so, on, the on Staten Island. Right. I would just add also that the oysters are really important, that they're a teaching tool for us, but they're also our engineering partners, and that over time the calcium carbonate um, begins to protect the structure, and studies have shown that it actually reduces the maintenance of the breakwater. 
um, and it also serves to sort of filter the water, to clean the water um, over time, and in, in general becomes, um, it also, because of the sort of micro texture of the oyster, it also adds a sort of complexity to the surface that further reduces the waves. You're making me hungry. Are they also <laughs> harvestable for dinner? I hope not. <laughs> not? Not. Um, I would never want to compete with fishermen to res as we're restoring oysters into the harbor, right? So once you open it up to harvest, then you're c competing with competing with fishermen. Uh -huh. The other thing is, as long as um, our uh, untreated wastewater flows into the harbor every time it rains, they're going to be poisonous, um, and they'll make you sick if you eat them. So they're not oysters for eating. Th they're not eating. We should like them and appreciate them for the services they provide for, to the environment. And they also, in some way, help the uh, fishermen industry, right? Uh, yeah, so many of the commercially important species of fish in the North Atlantic spend a portion of their lives in the Hudson River. And those, those fish used to either eat or live in or find their mates in New York Harbor oyster reefs. And without the reefs, they've been kind of sent to the edges and find whatever habitat they can. But the vast majority of the, har of the harbor is inhabitable to, those, to all those animals. Right. Staten Island itself um, had a very vibrant recreational fisheries um, economy mm -hmm. and uh, there's like whale watching out there now so we hope that our project can regenerate that ecological fabric but also help to bring back some of this econ the One economy. One more slide. Yeah. Tell us what we're looking at here Kate. Well this is a thick protective section and I think the idea is you know if you kind of imagine this as a section that's pulled across it's not just one singular wall or one monofunctional piece of infrastructure that can be suddenly overtopped. It's a thick layered section that pairs an offshore habitat breakwater with onshore um, absorptive edges and, and, and dunes and, and then and, and this, yeah, and, and people so that, are in the equation too, right? Yeah, Programs yeah. and activities. To the left because this mm -hmm. is really out to sea is to the right and That's onto correct. land and further into the land, onto the land is to the left. That's right. It's a, it's a section um, that is a complex section that integrates land and water. Right, which shows that it's not just one thing and then the next thing, mm -hmm. but after the high ground, you have the 100-year right. floodplain, the coastal edge as separate from that, tidal yeah. flats as yet separate as another right. thing. I think that's really for us, you know, the, the true definition of resiliency, right? That you have redundant um, um, systems and you have room for change and growth, not a singular moment that can be fail catastrophically and be overtopped like a traditional wall or levee. You have a thick section that can uh, be absorptive of multiple and different kinds of events. Did, did you say you just got another big grant? <laughs> yeah, the National Science Foundation, so the New York, the um, New York Harbor Foundation, Billion Oyster Project, and through uh, PACE and the University of Maryland, and a bunch of other, uh, many other partners, including the, the New York Aquarium and the, the River Project, all got a grant to implement, um, to design and implement curriculum in public schools. So now uh. public school teachers will be teaching Billion Oyster Project lessons in their classrooms. Uh. How much was that? It's a $5 million $5 grant million from the National dollars. Science Foundation. So you get $5 million from the NSF, you got the Buckminster Fuller Prize. This is obviously serious, <laughs> as a lot of serious people are taking you very seriously. Good luck with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Up next, Crossing Brooklyn, art from Bushwick, Bed-Stuy, and beyond. Young artists in New York City planted their flag in Brooklyn some time ago branding the BK Borough, the city's, the region's epicenter of bohemia and creativity. The Brooklyn Museum is now celebrating the fruits of its local art scene with a new exhibition called Crossing Brooklyn Art from Bushwick, Bed-Stuy and beyond. It is on display until January 4th. One can get a quick sense of the energy behind the art from the museum's 82nd promotional video by Rava Films, which is a piece of art in itself.
that art exhibition and related activities take place not just in the galleries of the Brooklyn Museum, but in public spaces and the streets and waterways of Brooklyn. So here to explain and share some more images is Eugenie Tsai. She is the John and Barbara Vogelstein Curator of Contemporary Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Welcome. Thank you, Welcome. I'm just going to throw up the first image here and let's talk about a piece of art and then we'll back off and talk about um, the larger thing. So what is this horse? This is a piece called The Commons by an artist named Paul Ramirez Jonas. If you know your art history, you might realize that this is based on a Roman statue of Marcus Aurelius that at one time sat on the Capitoline Hill. But of course, Paul has removed the image of the emperor and he has rendered this horse in cork. I'm not sure if you can see oh, it here. Oh, that's cork. And as it sat in the, as it sits in the gallery, it, it, it was empty when it went into the gallery except for push pins. So of course, you are invited, and in fact, we have a sign saying, please feel free to really? leave something on the horse. Uh, on the actual horse, or is that mainly at the on the base, base? But it has become. There's a, a lot bit. of little piece of paper with push yes. pins. Is that what we're looking at? Yes, and this is actually not how it looks at the museum. Uh -huh. It is uh, at another venue. Right now, it's covered with things, and clearly, there's a kind of competition where people try to get things up high onto the horse without stepping on the base. But of course, the commons commonly held values, ideals, uh, nature, intellectual property, uh, proposes a more democratic model of society than the emperor. So perhaps, you know, uh, Paul is suggesting alternatives to uh, a kind of imperial rule. What messages are people tending to post? Oh, well, there are business cards, money, uh, photographs. Uh, people like to leave uh, condoms, diapers, uh, lollipops, which we remove, some pills, all, anything that people, you can find in people's pockets and bags. So it's... Uh, Brooklyn Redux. Exactly. All right. So what's the big picture of this exhibit? And then we'll see a lot of other small pictures okay. of things that people can look at. So what I did want to mention about this piece is usually when you go to a museum, you're told not to touch things. You're supposed to walk around and keep your hands to yourselves. And as this piece shows and invites you to do, this, uh, some of the work in this exhibition invites you to participate, to be very hands-on. Um, and this one does as well in a slightly different way. So this is not really a, a, a survey of every artistic trend that's currently going on in Brooklyn. It's a focused exhibition that highlights work of artists whose work engages somehow with the world. So you can see in, in Paul's uh, horse, the commons, uh, participants, visitors to the museum are actually invited to pin something, to leave something. Um, can we go back to that last image, which is actually called Smiley Bag Smiley Portraits. Bag. This is Nobu Aizaki. And you can see here, he, he has one of these stands. And you can see the little portrait free uh, in pink above the stand. He has one of these in the museum, in the galleries, and another which he takes out on the street. And here he's like one of the portrait uh, people who draw your portrait at Times Square, maybe the Empire State Building, any touristic site, except he uses as his starting point one of the smiley bags that you might get from a takeout restaurant. So he sits on a stool, he has his sitter, and he uh, renders all of the details of the person's being on top of this smiley bag. Uh, so that it's very much a portrait, but yet at the same time everyone looks the same, mm -hmm. which I think is a kind of interesting, I, I won't Comment say Comment on humanity, we're all different, <laughs> we're, but we're all some, the same. Something like that, and, and everyone loves it. You know, everyone, there's a line when he does it at the museum and then when he goes out. And so where else is this exhibition? How is it spread around Bed-Stuy and beyond? Bed-Stuy and beyond, well, uh, Marie Laurence, whose work you saw in the film and who has a ha handmade boat that she takes around the waterways of New York, we, in order to convey the full uh, character of her work, we did have a boat tour, which she did with the, uh, a boat club in Brooklyn. And, um, and so you could go out with her 
on a tour. Uh, she uses the tides. And that was a kind of one evening event which complemented her video installation in the gallery. Nobu, of course, is out and about in Brooklyn mm -hmm. as well as with in New Zealand with the smiley bags. face bags. And a group called Totlo has a small booth which they take around to different neighborhoods in Brooklyn surveying the individuals in Brooklyn about various things. What is, what is your favorite animal? What do you do to relax? They have a whole survey that they uh, and, administer. And we've got an image up here and of a is, garden. This is a, well, this is a community garden in Brownsville, New York. Wait, is this art or is it agriculture? Well, that's a good question. And this is uh, a project by a group called Project Eat, started by Linda Good Bryant. It is, uh, and, and during the time of, and before the, mu the exhibition started, the museum became an annex of Project Eats. So they planted gardens on museum grounds. They started a green market every Thursday in front of the museum. And they now have what's called an energy hub in front of the museum on Thursdays and Saturdays, which are bicycles hooked up. Uh, and you pedal your bicycle, and the power is stored in batteries, which are then used on farms such as the one you see here. So this is a work that... But again, the art museum component of this is what? Uh, agriculture as urban agriculture as design it's 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 community building and it is started uh, by Linda Good Bryant who ran an, a gallery in the 70s called just above Midtown one of the earliest venues in the 70s for African-American artists at a time when there was were very very few she regards this as a continuation of that and of uh, the possibility again of um, helping people see that they have all the tools that they need within themselves mm -hmm. to help them achieve what they want. A little bit like Marcel Duchamp's uh, urinal where she says it's art she's, and she's coming from an art background and we can only take her at her word. So it does fit very much into the urban gardening trend of Brooklyn and other parts of New York, but it is also very much an art project. Next image. This one is called I Love You More that one more day, did I get that I love right? More than one day. More than one a day. A title from the Joan Sorry. Didion book, uh, ah. or a line from the Joan Didion book, uh, A Year of Magical Thinking. I have yet to find that line. But yes, it's 365 Paintings of the Sky by Cindy Danyo. Of the sky. Of the sky. She went out every day and, and documented the sky, either through a charcoal sketch, a pencil drawing, a photograph, and then she spent another three months making paintings from those. And, and they're arranged in the grid. So you really have encapsulated in this room one year. It's very cinematic. You really get a sense of this passage of time, perhaps a sense of mortality. All the same passage, of, uh, the same section of sky. No, different no, places. No, different places. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. And tell me the artist's name again. Cindy Danyo. Um, how did you choose? 35 artists or works out of the 35 gazillion that are being created that, in Brooklyn? That's a very good question. My co-curator, Rujeko Hockley, and I made over 100 studio visits. And you're going to ask how we decided which studios to visit. <laughs> we had our own lists, and we also consulted colleagues whose opinions we value. And so we set off and uh, started looking at studios. Clearly, there could have been many, many more artists who could have been included, but we also had spatial constraints and constraints of time. And so this seemed like a good number and representative of the kind of art that we wanted to show. Let's look at another image. What is this, neon? Uh, this is a neon mask, and you saw a bit of it in the promotional film. This is a piece, the part of a piece as it appeared at a different venue. But it's uh, neon masks based on African masks the artist Brendan Fernandez saw on Canal Street. Uh, and he's quite interested in the notion of African masks and how they permeate our culture both through uh, the street, African vendors selling replicas, as well as the way they're shown at places like the Metropolitan Museum and slightly decontextualized. Let's, let's uh, in our last couple of minutes, rip through a number of images. Give us you know, your six-word takes. Gordon Hall examining the lecture as an art form. All right, lecture as an art form, next. Nina Cacciatorian, Peas. part of her Peas on an image, part of her airplane series, works of art made in an airplane on, on trips from here to there. A moving studio through the air, 
that's con where, who, and with a location that's constantly changing. So she uses things like her snacks and airline magazines and s does setups and, a f and cool. her phone. Uses Next her phone. one. This is Dina Lawson, who takes photographs, a, a kind of looking at the uh, family of the uh, a, a, a mythological uh, African diasporic family. So examining sites like Haiti, you're seeing a photograph from Haiti here, Miami, Jamaica, and Brooklyn. And she's also going to work in Africa. Next. Marie Laurence, she's the one, the lady with the boat, who made the boat and is uh, travels the waterways of the post-industrial city here. Uh, she has a camera here attached to the boat, uh, a go pack attached to her back, and also a, a But wait, is she in that boat? Bow. She is on the boat, yes. This is a still from a video. So if you come to the museum, you'll see all three views as you sit on the bleachers made from driftwood she's found. Thank you very much for coming. Fascinating You're very stuff. Welcome. Thank at the you. Brooklyn Museum at and Brooklyn around Museum. town till January 4th. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. And that's our program for this week. You'll find us here each week at this hour. Next time, a special program celebrating my 25 years on public radio. We ask what has changed and what hasn't changed that we thought would in New York and around the world in the last quarter century. The guests, Gail Collins, David Remnick, and Tavis Smiley. And do tune in to the ongoing 26th year of that daily radio program, weekday mornings on WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching and for listening, too.